Greetings, comrades. Can you picture a Russian billionaire? A sudden rise in the 90s, dubious connections, comfortable life in London somewhere, expensive yachts and mansions. And now, think about how a man who created Russia's first commodity exchange and became one of the richest people in Russia in the early 90s should look like. Well, this man now looks like this. He lives in the countryside, adheres to a kind of his own calendar, is an ardent opponent of shaving beards and is extremely hostile towards science and technology. He sells bread for $20 in Moscow, forbids people of non-traditional sexual orientation from entering his stores and dreams of becoming the ruler of an ethnically homogeneous Russia. It would seem that the man has just lost his mind. Should I really talk about him? But no. After all, not every millionaire has a story where he flies to Afghanistan to buy two particular very special sheep and gets captured by the Taliban. Anyway, German Sterligov, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, even his early life is quite interesting. It's not very often that someone who worked as a lathe operator becomes a millionaire on the opening day of his new business. But we're not here to listen to some success story. We're here to listen to a story of falling into the abyss of madness, maybe? Or the story of the ingenious exploitation of the image of the radical orthodox traditionalist monarchist. You decide. But believe me. Most of the stories associated with German Sterligov are absolutely insane. So, the year is 1992. The USSR collapsed and Russia is entering probably the craziest times in its history. You are a 25-year-old millionaire, the owner of the network of commodity exchanges called Alisa, the first of its kind in the Soviet Union. You have a lot of money. You can do anything you want. By the way, how is that some random lathe operator managed to create the first commodity exchange of the USSR, which then was used by almost every single company? Was it just luck? There are two versions. The first version, yes, basically just luck. Luck and the fact that Sterlingov was in the right place at the right time. People needed a place for their trading deals, and his exchange provided it. Another version is that it was all about the protection he got namely KGB Major General Alexander Sterligov. A relative or just a guy with the same last name, no one knows for sure. But he did offer Germans some kind of support. Ok, so you are young and you have a lot of money. What do you do? Buy a yacht, 10 years supply of champagne and never go back online? Well, no. The first thing Sterligov did was head to Chechnya, which had declared independence, to negotiate with Jahar Dudaev to have Sterligov represent their interests in the world. To be honest, the only thing that surprises me about these negotiations, knowing the guy's behavior, is the fact that Sterligov got out of there alive and in one piece. He also had negotiations with the Brazilian government to erect a monument commemorating Asta Bender, a character from the 12 chairs and the little golden calf, in Rio de Janeiro. Now that would be cool. So bad he was not able to convince them. Or offer them enough money, actually. At about the same time, Sterligov's financial rise also came to an end. No, he was still a millionaire, but he no longer had such enormous profits. Some economic reforms took place, the exchanges became ordinary trading platforms and their owners received only some small brokerage percentage. So Sterligov plunged into the turmoil and mayhem of the 90s got his moment of glory and many millions of dollars, but then things went downhill. And apparently, he saw this experience as a mistake. He decided that our country should have other values and ideals. That capitalism is not the way it should be. That our country is the great and holy Rus. And well, he devoted his life to the revival of Russia. The Russia he wanted to see. In 1995, he created the Noble Assembly of Moscow and became its leader, setting himself the goal to restore the nobility in Russia. Obviously, he insisted that his family always belonged to it. However, there is no evidence of this fact, actually. 
Well, as the leader of the nobility, German had to do something significant, something historical. For example, find the lost library of Ivan the Terrible. How about this? A mysterious library called Liberia, which supposedly contained up to 800 unique volumes, capable of shedding light on the forgotten history of the world. It was once taken out of the besieged capital of Byzantium, and then safely hidden by the Russian Tsars. Naturally, it is most likely a myth, and there either was no such collection, or it just didn't survive. But Sterlingov managed to convince the mayor of Moscow to fund the search. Two years of unprecedented in scale excavations were conducted in several old Russian cities at once. Naturally, to no avail. After that, he created a few more odd ventures, like coffin manufacturing company. But German's main passion at that time was politics. He took part in every election he could. Mayor of Moscow, governor of the Krasnoyarsk region, and even the president of Russia in 2004. After his failure in the latter, he got disillusioned with politics, accumulated lots of debts, and decided to quit everything and leave Moscow. Or maybe he got a message that he'd better not get involved in any more political stuff. Who knows? So, 2004. German, his wife and four children move to the deep woods in the Majaisk district of the Moscow region. They live in a tent for several months, while their new home is being built. This causes Sterlingov to disappear from the public eye for several years. He did, however, show up once, with that crazy story about sheep and the Taliban. In October 2007, he went to Afghanistan to buy two sheep from a province controlled by the Taliban. He and his companions were detained by armed men and were held hostage for some time. Only the intervention of the Russian foreign ministry helped the eccentric millionaire to return home safely. Sterlingov's version is a little different. According to him, they changed into ethnic clothes, were preparing to cross the border of Iran and then ran into a fortress where a secret summit of the CIS and Pakistani heads of state was taking place. Sounds believable. Upon his return from Afghanistan, Sterlingov also re-entered the Russian media spotlight, triumphantly presenting his new political program. Sterlingov announced that from now on he hated many things. Television, the education system, doctors, abortions, witches and other scientists, especially physicists and chemists, fiction, music and so on. He even had a plan to build his own settlements, away from rotten society, so that the children would grow up among normal people. Sounds familiar, right? The rhetoric of some totalitarian cult. Sterlingov positioned himself as an old-style landowner, worshipping old Russian traditions and customs. He planned to establish organic farms on his land that would offer elite natural products for the major cities of Russia. And he succeeded. He opened this chain of natural goods stores in Moscow and other cities. And it was instantly discussed and criticized for two reasons. The first was the absolutely wild pricing of groceries. For example, a loaf of rye bread from Sterlingov was worth about $20. By comparison, regular bread cost about 50 cents at most back then. Extra for naturalness, I guess. The second reason was even wilder. All of Sterlingov's stores had special signs that said homosexuals, actually he used the more root form, were not allowed in the stores. This did not really surprise anyone, because Sterlingov had been promoting homophobia for a long time. However, he had to remove these signs from the stores by court order and pay a hefty fine. His personal estate, which he calls Slobada, is open for everybody, but also has some restrictions. Not only homosexuals are banned, but also men with earrings, women with naked navels and armpits, and women in short skirts. By the way, anything even slightly above the floor is a short skirt. Smoking, carrying cell phones and using electricity are also forbidden in Sterlingov's Slobada. They have their own calendar, too. It is now the year 705030 from the creation of Adam. By the way, as you might have guessed, Sterlingov does not consider women to be real people, not even his wife. He believes that domestic abuse only strengthens the family. 
when looking for female helpers for his farms. He specifically pointed out in his ad that harassment is guaranteed, because there are many healthy, normal men working in his Slobada. And strangely enough, Stelligov's farm lives on, with people coming to work for him from all over the country, people who agreed to live and work by his rules. Rules which are perverted and twisted principles of ancient Russian life. Sterlingov calls himself an orthodox Christian, but the church does not really acknowledge him. He is just too hardcore, even by their standards. He is against industrialization, against electricity, against science, against school, against alcohol, in favor of going back to the roots, to simple Russian life. He believes that if a woman is married but not pregnant at any particular moment, then it is a terrible sin, both for her and for her husband. He published a textbook for school children. A textbook of history, from Adam to Putin. It reveals that Nicholas III committed suicide, Alexander II was killed by Alexander III, the Romanov's family had survived an execution and lived in Britain afterwards, and all Russian gold was smuggled out by Jews three months after the Treaty of the Brest-Litovsk. One day he is a suspect in the case of the far-right group Born, whose fighters stated during interrogation that they had trained on the grounds of the Sterling of Slobada. Next day he organizes an annual peasant fair, with horse-drawn carts and bearded men in kasavarotkas, with Gucci bags over their shoulders. Truly, a man of many talents. In fact, German Sterligov is a man who had struck gold once, but was unable to hold on to it. And instead of that capitalist formula for success, he found a new one, the formula he had seen in the paintings of the Russian classic artists, where the peasants work hard and he, the landowner, rules them with a strong hand. For all the insanity of this man, one cannot help but notice that he is still alive and still coming up with more and more crazy projects. And apparently he has many influential acquaintances who are willing to finance these crazy projects. So maybe he is not that insane after all. And all of this is just some sort of a cover? I don't know, really. But I know one thing for sure. If German Sterlikov did not exist, he would definitely be worth creating.